And Mark, am I missing anything else or are we all set? I think we're all set to uh, introduce Kimball. Great. But before that, I would like to introduce Susan Gilliland, who will introduce Kimball. Thank you, Ron. Um, tonight, we'd like to welcome back Kimball Garrett. Kimball is certainly no stranger to most of us. Kimball started birding at a very young age and today is one of Southern California's most accomplished birders and is the leading authority on the birds of Los Angeles County. Kimball has been the Ornithology Collections Manager at Los Angeles Natural History Museum since 1982. Kimball has a long list of publications, including several definitive works, The Field Guide to Warblers on North America, The Birds of Southern California, Status and Distribution, and The Birds of Southern California, all co-authored with his longtime childhood friend, John Dunn. Kimball's list of accomplishments goes on and on, but there may be one thing you might not know about Kimball. Kimball is not only an accomplished ornithologist, but an author of Birds of California Explained in Haiku, which is a type of short form poetry originally from Japan. So with apologies to haiku poets and to Kimball, we have a haiku to introduce tonight's topic, exotic dilemmas and gross domestic products. Duck, goose, who are you? Slashes, spas, and identification, or maybe just not. So without further ado, please welcome Kimball Garrett. Well, thank you for that. I did not expect a haiku um, and I'll have to write that one down. But anyway, um, it's great to talk to everybody. This series on identification spuzz and slashes started out a couple months ago. And you heard presentations. I know John Feenstra did Kingbirds, and you heard Mark's presentation on sapsuckers, and they set the bar pretty high. So I thought my mission tonight would be to lower that bar back down as low as I possibly could. And that would be to talk about exotics um, and some of the issues and identification issues that they pose. So we'll launch into that right now. I'm gonna try to share my screen here if I can find my talk. There it is. And um get to excuse me second view full screen and you should see my talk coming up here i yeah. also will um i think get rid of my video um just so my bandwidth is a little better you don't want to look at me anyway so we live in an area where a lot of introduced birds um, occur and a lot of things escape. This is a byproduct, of course, of having so many humans who move birds all around the globe. And of course, people have been domesticating certain kinds of birds for thousands of years. And many of these domestic forms end up back in the wild, which is what we would call feral birds. So. Uh, we've got a lot of things, some of which we're very familiar with, some of which many birders are less familiar with. So I thought I just, what I wanted to do was just kind of talk about the sorts of issues that these introduced birds, escapees, uh, feral domestics, and so on, pose to birders. And a lot of this is gleaned from some of the things we see entered into eBird, where people are tricked by some of these. Um, so it's not going to be an in-depth identification review. We're not going to talk about how to distinguish the you know, several dozen breeds of mallards that have been in um, captivity and domestic, domesticity for hundreds or thousands of years, but instead just talk about some of the problems they pose. So um, what I would like to do now is just remind you that this series is called Slashes, Spuzz, and Identification or Not. Um, slash is a very useful term because often we can't identify things down to species, uh, but we might get it down to a species pair or a group. And so that's perfectly fine. If that's as far as you can get, that's uh, the level of identification. Spuzz would just be referred to a group where you know what group it belongs to, but not what species, such as a hummingbird spa or a pitonex spa. So, um, so tonight I just wanted to review some of the identification 
conservation issues that are posed in, in general by things like feral domestic species. Again, these are domesticated things which have been bred often to look very different from their original wild type ancestors and then often escape or are released or, or somehow become feral and live in the wild. Um, among these and other introduced species, we often see hybridization, which really mixes things up. So some of these feral domestics like gray lag geese and swan geese could pretty much care less who they mate with. Um, so there's basically everything in between and sometimes they'll mate even with additional species, sometimes even native species. Um, among our introduced birds, we know that we're seeing hybridization between things like lilac crown and red crown parrots and possibly between some of our Cytocara parakeets and the yellow chevron white winged parakeets and so on, but certainly the Amazons. I want to talk a little bit about ID issues posed by naturalized non-native species, which are here usually through the pet trade. Um, some of these are unfamiliar to many birders, and this was especially true oh, 10, 20, 30 years ago when many of them were not treated in any of the standard field guides. And people really got uh, thrown for a loop by many of these introduced birds. Now, fortunately, most of the, the really comprehensive field guides like National Geographic, and Sibley and so on, do treat most but not all of the exotics that have been naturalized in Southern California and elsewhere. And then, of course, we live in an area with a lot of aviculture and escapees. Really, anything can show up here and anything does. And so, uh, again, we're often thrown for a loop when we're out in the field and just see something that we know it's probably not a native. We don't know what it is. And then how do you go about identifying it when really it could have come from anywhere in the world? So these are just kind of the fun, some of the fun things we run into. So how do non-native species get here? Well, again, we have deliberately introduced some primarily for uh, hunting for game species. The pet trade is responsible for most of our non-natives because they're brought here from other parts of the world. Inevitably, eventually some escape or are released and they possibly can establish reproducing and long surviving populations um, through accidental releases, escapes, release of smuggled birds and so on. Then we have the domesticated birds, anything from chickens and guinea fowl to various ducks and geese and peafowl and so on that um, really can, can live in the wild but often retain some of the bizarre plumages and shapes from some of the domesticated breeds which differ from the wild types. And something else I will just barely touch on at the end is non-native species can also get here uh, sort of accidentally through things like ship assistance. And this is a real headache for analyzing records of vagrant birds in coastal California, particularly from Asia. Um, we've kind of thrown up our hands and thrown in the towel and said, we just don't know in most cases, but we'll talk about a couple instances there where this might be what has brought them here. And why should we care about non-native exotic species? Well, first of all, of course, many of them could potentially have impacts on our native species impacts on habitats. And for our purposes tonight, they can also just give us identification headaches. So having said that, let's put up the poll number one and see if uh, what people think of this bird. So Ron was putting together the poll questions and here he is. You can grab that poll and move it off to the side with your mouse um, if it's hiding the bird. So just, just grab it at the top or somewhere and move it over. And then um, give you a, a few seconds here. Decide what it is. So, Campbell, would we'll you mind? We do. Campbell, would you mind actually telling uh, people because uh, people on YouTube can't see the poll? So, what the question is and what the uh, potential answers are. Okay, our three poll questions. The, the question is very simple. What kind of bird is this? So here your choices are domestic gray lag goose, domestic swan goose, a snow goose, a Ross's goose, the domestic mallard, or all of the above, speaking of hybridization, or none of the above. And I will just preface your guesses by saying, I don't know the answer, except that it might be an answer. 
And uh, the answers are coming in. We have about 60% of the people have answered. Oh, now we're having, we had suddenly a surge came through. And we're going to be closing off the poll in about five seconds. So get your vote in four, three, two, and one. And poll is closed. And Kibble, here are the results. Let's look at the results. Okay, they're nicely mixed. Um, so my thoughts on this bird, which I think was probably photographed at Apollo Lake, which is the epicenter of bizarre domestic waterfowl that's out in the Lancaster area, is probably it either is or has some genes from the domestic gray lag goose in it. So that's the answer. And of course, as you know, these geese are in the genus answer. So that's <laughs> my poor joke. Um, does it have domestic swan goose genes? Well, maybe, but it doesn't have the knob on the bill and certainly none of the coloration patterns. Um, but then this bird is obviously not a naturally colored bird. It's mostly white. Um, it's not a snow goose. Although many people are not aware of exotics try to pass these off as a native, so they might think of something like a snow goose, um, which can have bluish plumages um, or blue admix there, but I would say the bill shape alone would rule that out. And it's certainly not a Ross's goose for the same reasons. Um, domestic geese versus domestic mallards can create problems because some domestic mallards are huge and gross and fat and look goose-like. But this is not a mallard or duck-like bill, it's a goose bill. So all of the above, which 19% of you guessed, would, I guess, postulate that this is a hybrid involving those five species above. I judge that as being unlikely, though I don't blame you for guessing that. <laughs> and none of the above is a perfectly valid guess, although it would um, then caused me to wonder, well, what is it? And cer certainly one thing you might wonder is could it have Canada goose genes? Because many of these uh, domestic geese will interbreed with Canada geese. Uh, the bill shape might be a little more Canada goose-like, so it could possibly be uh, hybrid offspring or, or some subsequent generation that combined answer genes like a gray lag goose with Canada goose genes. Uh, but I don't know. So if anybody has any strong thoughts or even weak thoughts and want to put them in the chat um, or bring it up as a question later at the end, that would be great. So I and, just thought it would be great to start off with a poll where I have no, no clue what the answer is. <laughs> and I just wanted to remind okay, people. Okay, we can close the poll. I just want to remind people if you put things in the chat to please share with everyone so everyone can see it. Okay, here's poll number two. And for those of you who on YouTube who will not see the poll questions, let me again say this is simply a question of what bird is this? And your choices are crested duck, domestic gray lag goose, domestic mallard, tufted duck, Koskarova swan, or none of the above. So if you want to go ahead and vote on that, um, we'll see what the results are. And again, to remind you, you can drag that poll question off to the side if it's blocking the photo. And the answers are coming in. We, uh, the answer is coming in very quickly. So we'll be closing the poll in a few seconds. Please get your last minute answers in. In five, four, three, two, and one. And here are the results, Kimball. Okay, well, we have a strong sentiment here this time. And I would have to say I agree with the two thirds of you who said this was a domestic mallard. Now, technically, the 12% of you who call this a crested duck are not wrong because that is a, an English name that is often given to a particular breed of mallard that has that bizarre tuft of feathers on the head. So it is in fact a crested duck um, version of a domestic mallard. 
But crested duck also refers to another wild species. Um, I believe it's South American. And it certainly is not that. It's not a goose. That's not a goose bill. It's not that triangular goose bill. And uh, the neck doesn't seem long enough. Um, I hardly have to explain why it's not a tufted duck, although it does have a tuft. The Coscaroba swan is a South American entirely white swan shaped bird with an orange beak, but it's not this shape. And none of the above is always a nice guess. But in this case, I think we are definitely looking at a particular breed of domestic mallard. So very good. So go ahead and close that poll. Okay, and here's the next and the last poll question, and then we'll launch into the meat of the talk. So let's just to see where we are. And again, the question is, what bird is this? So your choices are a Northern red bishop, a yellow crowned bishop, a pin-tailed whida, a grasshopper sparrow, a house sparrow, or none of the above. So we'll give you a minute. And the answers are coming in. Okay, we're gonna close the poll in five, four, three, get your, get your answers in, two and one. And here are the results, Kimball. Okay, well, a slight uh, plurality went for Northern Red Bishop. I note that nearly half of you chose Northern Red or Yellow Crown Bishop, both of which are seen in the wild around here, although mostly Northern Red Bishops. Uh, Pintail Wida, Grasshopper Sparrow got some votes. House Sparrow got 5%. And 20% of you who are correct said none of the above. This is a bobolink. And okay, I'm being really mean here because our topic is exotic species, but I really wanted to underscore the point that uh, people can mess this up all the time, calling uh, something like a bishop, a female or non-breeding male bishop, a bobolink or a grasshopper sparrow or some other native species. Um, it was a very understandable 20 years ago when these weren't in a lot of the field guides but now we're getting much more familiar with these. So um, I will come back to this and explain later just sort of what some of the distinctions are when we get to that part of the talk. But just wanted to um, emphasize that these issues with exotics certainly apply not just to things like waterfowl, but to passerines and other things as well. So very good. Thanks for participating here. We can go ahead and close that poll. So let's just review some of the domestics and exotics that, that give us headaches. Um, one of the most common park geese is the domestic gray lag goose. The gray lag is a Eurasian, largely European, but Eurasian goose in the genus Anser, A-N-S-E-R. Um, now I'm calling these gray lag geese, but we can never really be sure whether they share genes with the swan goose, which is domesticated in China. Um, many of these, again, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of years ago, and certainly interbreed in, in many areas in captivity. So there's a lot of gene sharing there. And it's, it's rare that you see kind of a pure looking wild type bird, but these are somewhat typical of domestic gray lag geese with orangey or orangey pink bills very sat looking pot belly things with a, a just not shape like what would look like a typical fit wild goose. Um, these kind of striations along the neck are very distinctive. And the head and neck are pretty uniformly gray and the bill is pretty standard triangular shape. Um, now, depending on the, the genes of these domestic, these feral gray lag geese, they can have very varying amounts of white in the plumage. Uh, such as the one on the left, which is showing sort of a white fronted goose like white face pattern and even be pure white. But this is a standard sort of park 
goose to learn. And there are many places around here to go look at them. Some of my favorite birding areas like Apollo Park in the Antelope Valley or MacArthur Park and um, some, of, some other parks, um, Irvin Magic Johnson Park, many of these parks with lakes will have plenty of domestic escape or domestic geese. So what's the big issue there with uh, confusion with native species? That would of course be our native answer goose, the white fronted or greater white fronted goose. Here's one, a long staying bird at Apollo Lake. Um, but this, uh, it just doesn't have that obesity of a barnyard gray lag goose. It has a much more distinct white face pattern. The bill is more pink, less orange. And it, it's a much smaller bird. I think if I go to the next, um, well, here's another comparison. Now this goose on the left is either, well, it appears to be an intergrade between gray lag and swan geese. So we'll get to swan geese in a second, but you can see it's got, um, a lot of dark on the back of the neck. It's got a bit of a big bump at the base of the bill. So it's certainly showing swan goose characters, although likely uh, it's got hybrid ancestry. On the right, of course, is a greater white fronted goose, which has a much neater face pattern with a white patch contrasting with the dark gray brown head. The black bars on the belly are somewhat different from those on the domestic swan and gray lag geese. And it's just not as obese. If you were to see them together, um, these domestic answer geese can be really big and fat. So there's a greater white fronted in the back left at Apollo Lake with some of its big cousins here, which are a combination of probably mostly gray lag geese like the white one on the left, maybe the one in the lower right, um, a mostly swan goose in the back right. So it's kind of fun to just go look at these things and try and put a percentage on them. So, so the domestic swan goose, again, it shares with the domestic gray lag being quite obese. Uh, the one on the left shows a pretty much wild type pattern of the dark stripe from the crown down the back, back of the neck and a large knob at the base of the bill. Um, but it's clearly a feral domestic, partly because it's here instead of in China, but also because um, it's just obese. Uh, on the right is a mostly swan goose domestic, uh, again, quite obese with kind of a funny knob on the bill, maybe not as distinct a pattern. So the bottom line here is in eBird, we don't like to give you the choice of putting in a swan, domestic swan goose or domestic gray lag goose because so many of the ones around here are in between. So we prefer you just enter them as domestic answer goose, which is the choice that'll show up on your eBird list. But you can go into eBird if you get a bird that really clearly fits the characters of one or the other. You can go into the um, rarities or add species function and, and add either gray lag or swan goose. So again, many of them have the natural plumage colors totally bred out of them are completely white. Uh, so here's a domestic answer probably uh, mostly gray leg or pure gray leg on the left, um, probably more of a mostly or pure swan goose on the right. So since they're both all white, you would use shape characters, particularly bill and knob shape to tell the two. But again, we are discouraging you from really trying to identify these domestics to species. But we do encourage you not to confuse them with native white geese like this snow goose on the right which of course has a very distinctive grinning patch on the bill um, and the black wingtips. Now, sometimes those black wingtips can be largely hidden or in molting birds actually be missing, but um, please look at the wingtips of a white goose before you um, call it a snow goose. And if it looks more like that thing on the left and has pure white wingtips, um, that would be a domestic gray leg or domestic answer goose. Now things start to get really complicated in part because these domestic answer geese will often nowadays interbreed with Canada geese, which have become very common residents in many of these same urban parks. So this could be a gray leg, it could have swan goose genes, but this could very well have Canada goose genes as well. Frankly, I don't care enough to really try and figure it out, but I just want to show you some examples of the bewildering array of geese and geese hybrids that you will find 
in the wild. And then of course you throw in a little bit of leucistic patterning like the white crown as well. And it makes it pretty tough. And they can look really bizarre. So again, here is a gray leg or mostly gray leg goose. But I'm guessing that the black beak and something about what the pattern you can see on the head and neck, if you ignore the white, would possibly make this an intergrade between or at least have some Canada goose genes in there somewhere. Um, the bird on the back right, again, is a native goose. That's a Ross's goose, of course. This monster, I've, I think this was photographed at Sepulveda Basin, but I've seen what was probably the same bird in the Atwater area of the LA River. And I frankly don't know what it is. It towers over the Canada geese. Um, it could be a Canada goose that's leucistic and has a unnatural bill and foot colors, but it could have some gray lag or domestic goose genes in it as well. Um, but it's a bizarre bird. And again, they're just, you're gonna run into some really strange things. So get, get the DNA, I guess is my only solution. This is a native goose, believe it or not, but it's really messed up. Um, very often we will get brant that spend the summer and just get more and more and more worn through the summer, although they will make a valiant effort to molt in new feathers uh, later in their stay. So this was on a local beach in late summer, and this is a brant. But again, you would look at that and it's so different from a brant you would expect to see in good plumage or in your field guide. Uh, note that the tail is worn down to being virtually white. Um, but again, you would look at that and think, well, what weird domestic goose is this? But this is just a very worn brant, a native species. Okay, well, the mallard also has been under domestication for a very long time, for thousands of years. And they have bred so many bizarre, like the crested duck we saw in the poll question, varieties that those various genetic lineages often show up in feral mallards that are in many of our urban parks. So this would be a very typical wild type pair of male and female mallard. Um, I'm not gonna go into mallard issues with other native birds like Mexican duck um, identification and things like that, but that's certainly something to be aware of. It's something we're beginning to think a lot more about now that Mexican duck has been split and we know they occur in, in Southern California. But here's a very typical pair of wild mallards. But then you see things like this. Again, these are from my favorite spot, Apollo Park. And you see these uh, sort of pale, buffy, khaki colored mallards. You see these black and white things that might tempt you to think you have rediscovered the long extinct Labrador duck um, or who knows what you might want to make of it. But um, and in fact, this bird may very well have some Muscovy duck genes in it, judging from the long tail. But you get into these park lakes and you can see almost anything because these waterfowl almost literally don't care with whom they mate. Uh, we have very often seen entries of American black duck in eBird based on mallard to feral domestics that look more or less like say that left bird in the right-hand photo. Of course, American black ducks don't look anything like that, but it's a duck and it's black, so you gotta guess something. Um, the one on the left looks like it's sort of been through a wearing blender or something. Um, could use a new set of feathers, but just show you again some of the varieties um, it's, that you'll see in mallard. So on the right, you'll see certainly the, the pigment extremes from jet black to pure white in mallards. And, very often with that kind of fat bellied um, domestic goose, domestic duck look. So please don't call these black ducks. And we, this is our friend, the crested duck version of the mallard. This is another bird at Apollo Lake. Yeah, you, you just wonder if there was like a, you know, a release of radioactive material or something there, the way some of these waterfowl look. Another bird long under domestication in the new world is the Muscovy duck. Um, wild Muscovy ducks will not look anything like this. They're basically black with, uh, depending on the age and sex, varying white patch in the wing with very little in the way of red wattles around the head. So 
this bizarre red wattled face and the various browns and whites and other uh, plumage colors have all been bred in through domest domestication and uh, muscovies are certainly breeding in the wild in many urban park lakes along the LA River and so on. So this is just an example of some of the range of variation. But one thing they would have in common is a very long tail. These are arboreal, basically neotropical forest or woodland ducks in, in, in their native range and have very long tails for ducks and kind of a long beak and some bare skin and wattles around the head, but they, they can be extremely variable. The other thing oh, I should mention too is that they will frequently hybridize with mallards as I alluded to earlier. So you will see Muscovy duck mallard hybrids quite frequently in areas where you see feral mallards and feral muscovies. The swans, the only thing I wanted to mention here was just another case where an introduced species or sometimes escapees can be confused with native species. So this is of course a tundra swan, our native, one of our two native, well expected native swans here. But bear in mind that if you see a swan in a funny place, a funny time of year, in a funny plumage or soft part colors uh, that you should consider mute swan, which of course is established and fairly well established in parts of Northern California in the Bay Area, the Sierra foothills and so on. But here we just get the odd breeding pairs here and there. They don't seem to be any large or growing populations, but they certainly are around. This is an adult, which is very distinctive, but be aware um, of juvenile mute swans and, and some of the similarities they can show to native uh, tundra and trumpeter swans. One key feature of the mute swan is that kind of S-shaped neck uh, knobs at the base of the bill if they have it. And also they are longer tailed than the other swans. So they tend to swim around with a longer tail kind of sticking up, sticking out compared to our, um, this is a relatively short tailed tundra swan. So again, I don't want to go into any detail on these ID issues other than uh, just introduce them as the kinds of issues we have to deal with. Here's another case where a native bird can be confused with an introduced species. So this is a mandarin duck um, introduced locally into parts of California, especially in the North San Francisco Bay region. But we have breeding pairs and very small populations occasionally in Southern California. So this one was at El Mansur Park in Alhambra, which is a good place to go see mandarin ducks. So the males are very distinctive and would never be mistaken for their close relative, the wood duck. But the females are much more similar. So here you have three species um, and the upper right is a coot. So you can ignore that one. But on the, this uh, main picture on the right is a female mandarin duck and on the left, a female wood duck. And you can see they're awfully similar. So um, if you think you've got a wood duck in a funny place at a funny time, consider that it might be a, a either escaped or part of maybe a small population of mandarin ducks. So the pattern of white the ring around the eye and the postocular stripe are different. Wood duck has a much broader kind of pointed white ring. The mandarin's got a very narrow ring with a kind of a long, thin extension, more white around the base of the bill, and a smaller bill that's usually just kind of a uniform pinkish in color. Um, and some other subtle differences, but just be aware of that species pair and the possible confusion. By now, pretty much all Southern California birders are very familiar with Egyptian geese, which are well established on the coastal slope of Southern California and breeding in many areas. Um, so they're pretty distinctive looking. These are native, of course, to Africa. Um, they have been domesticated, but uh, most of ours are probably coming from avicultural collections and waterfowl collections, and uh, they fare very well here. But these are very distinctive, but this is a juvenile ear, which is a little less distinctly patterned, uh, but still retains enough of the adult patterning that I don't think it would cause any identification problems. So we're just going to mention some of the land birds that might create some confusion. Red whiskered bulbuls, of course, are now very well established, uh, not only in the San Gabriel Valley, but spreading a bit east, south, and west. Um, there are records even up into Ventura County these days and um, uh, seem to be spreading, not at a great rate, but certainly spreading also out toward West Los Angeles. 
So it's a very distinctive bird, but I can't tell you how many phone calls I've gotten at the museum describing to me an unusual bird they saw in their yard. And usually they get about four words out. And I say, it's probably a red whiskered bulbul. They'll just say, it's this funny bird and it sits high in the trees and it's got a loud call. That's all you need to know. Or they say it has a crest. That's all you need to know. This is a bird that's familiar to birders, but uh, so many people in the public just don't know what these things are, which is perfectly understandable, of course. It's a Indian and Southeast Asian species established here through the pet trade, but spreading. So the only caution I would mention here is that the red vented bulbul in the same genus, but with an entirely sooty brown head and neck and a shorter crest has been seen in small numbers in sort of the Arcadia, uh, Duarte, Temple City area and is always something to consider as a possibility as well. Um, by the way, the really good bird pictures are Mark Shields, so I've tried to acknowledge him in the, by citing the photographer. The, the rest of them are mine. Uh, another really fascinating bird that's exploding in numbers, as you know, in the Los Angeles and Orange County region is the, the white eyes, the genus Zosterops that we presume are Swinhoe's white eyes native to mainland Asia, um, China, and some adjacent areas, um, formerly lumped with the Japanese white eye, but recently split. And this is a bird that we still are trying to get really pinned down with genetics exactly what they are, but they appear to match Zosterop simplex or the Swinhoe's white eye. And they can, they are spreading um, as far up the coast as Point Doom and down to San Diego now and seem to be penetrating a little farther inland. I know they've been seen out in the like San Dimas area. Um, so this is a bird that could become, it's certainly now one of the most common birds in residential urban coastal slope Orange County. Um, that's my picture. This is Mark's picture, much better. Mark took this in Avalon on Santa Catalina Island. Uh, so they've spread out there, which is not surprising for a group of birds that has colonized many oceanic islands. So one thing white eyes, almost all the species, uh, ours and similar species have in common is that they have dark eyes, but they have a white ring of feathering around the eye. So white eye is a bit of a misnomer. Um, but um, this, the most similar species is probably the, what's called the Indian, or we used to call it the Oriental white eye, which had been established briefly in the 70s into the early 80s in San Diego, uh, the city of San Diego. Um, but these are birds you always want to document with photos and recordings, and we really want to pin down what they are, but they seem to be Swinhoe's white eyes. Now, again, before people were familiar with these, they would try to match these with a native species in their field guys that came the closest. So they might call it, oh, possibly a Nashville warbler or a McGillivray's warbler. You know, there's clearly a lot of differences, but the idea of trying to identify an exotic by just coming up with the closest thing in their field guide that matches it can be dangerous. And along those lines, I've always harp on what I call the single field mark syndrome, where somebody can notice one thing about a bird and come up with an identification uh, while ignoring many other characters of that bird that would certainly argue against that identification. So there was a time when a, this bird would be seen, somebody would report it, they'd look in their field guide, and the closest thing they could come up with would be fork-tailed flycatcher. Uh, when in fact, which is of course a very rare vagrant um, to California, in fact, the Southern California's first one just showed up last fall up in Santa Barbara County, but um, certainly a potential vagrant here. But the, the long tail feathers are the wrong feathers. It's got a thin flycatcher, black bill, everything else is wrong. Um, sorry, I, my arrows aren't working, so I'm using the scroll bar. This is the culprit with the long tail that people are seeing here. This is the pintailed wida. Doesn't look much like a fork tail flycatcher, but if you just go on that one field mark, long black tail feathers, you might come up with that. This has got, of course, a finch-like red bill, entirely different in behavior from a flycatcher, but you know, so it goes. Um, a non-breeding male will look something like this, and adult females will look basically similar to this, lacking the long tail feathers. And then of course you want to watch for juveniles. These are juvenile pintail whitas. 
with that funny curly cue of white on the gape, which uh, you would not find in some of the other juvenile exotics like uh, scaly breasted munia. The bill starts getting pinkish pretty quickly. And of course, these birds are not um, there. If you see a bird that's recently fledged, it looks like this. It's probably going to be fed by a scaly breasted munia, which is the host we know of, of this parasitic species. But it doesn't take long for these juveniles to gather into pure species flocks of whitas and eventually associate with adults. So that helps the identification process. But they're distinct. They're very plain birds, but that uh, funny gape mark is very distinctive. Um, then we get into some other finch-like things. This front bird, of course, is the long-staying Eurasian tree sparrow down in Wilmington in LA Harbor. It's actually at least the second record of a Eurasian tree sparrow from LA Harbor. Uh, so again, very closely related to the house sparrow and quite similar, although the crown color and that cheek patch are distinctly different. This bird's been, been there for years now. But um, this brings up the question of how did it get there? Being in one of the busiest, perhaps the busiest port in Western North America, with a lot of ship traffic from cities in Asia where this species is abundant, it's certainly reasonable to think that this bird was probably ship assisted. And some birders might even argue, well, then why can't it count as a naturally occurring vagrant? Ships are just sort of like, you know, big sea turtles or something, and you can just ride them across the ocean. So I don't want to get into that argument, but just be aware that ships can bring funny birds um, to our coastal areas. Here's another case where a bird that is familiar to all of us now, but originally before it was in the field guides, people would see a, what we now call the Northern Red Bishop or Orange Bishop on the left, try to match it with a bird in their field guide and come up with Vermilion Flycatcher. Even though the red and the dark are in completely different places on the bird, the behavior, the sounds and the bill shape are completely different. But now that we know these bishops are here, the ID problems are really not so much with the adult males, but with females and juveniles and so on. So here's a, a juvenile, possibly an adult female, and even the non-breeding adult males look something like that on the left, Northern Red Bishop. And these were often called grasshopper sparrows before people were familiar with them. So um, I took the blurry, Bishop picture on the left, so I figured I'd match it to a blurry grasshopper sparrow picture I took. This was the one down at the in Pico Rivera, at the San Gabriel Coastal Basin spreading grounds uh, through the winter. So vaguely similar, the grasshopper sparrow, even though it's got something of a spiky, not especially long tail for one of our native sparrows, it's still got a much longer tail than the bishop, which has that sort of stubby tail. Uh, the wing patterning, the back patterning and crown are very different. Of course, you see this distinctive little orangish patch on the grasshopper sparrow. So <clears throat> they're not really that similar, but again, if you're just if this bird's not in the field guide and you're trying to match it with something that is, it's a reasonable thing you'd come up with. And that brings us to our quiz question of the bobolink, which really is in many ways somewhat similar to a, uh, a female type bishop in plumage. Um, the back patterning is different. Uh, one big difference, of course, is the primary extension on long distance migrant bobolinks is very different from the relatively short rounded wing of a bishop. Uh, but again, just something to be uh, aware of. And they're often in the same weedy areas, eating grass seeds and polygonum seeds and things like that. So um, just something to be aware of that um, if you think you've got a bobolink, make sure you've ruled out a non-native bishop. And then, of course, the scaly breasted munias, which are now very familiar to all of you because they've become so numerous here. That's an ad adult on the left, an adult on the right, and a juvenile in the middle. Uh, people are pretty good now with ID of these things. Very thick black bill. Uh, the juveniles are very plain, but they're usually with adults and very often beginning the molt of, into adult like plumage. Uh, one thing I find people get wrong on these a lot is they assume that the patterned one, like the bird on the left, is the adult male. And the plain one, like the bird in the middle, is the adult female. That's not true. These are monomorphic in plumage that males and females are identical. So it's an age difference, not a sex difference. And then we get so many other escaped um, finch-like birds, the strilded finches from Africa, um, some from Asia, bishops, um, weavers, various things, even um, things like uh, uh, Crithagra, these um, 
yellow-fronted canaries from Africa, uh, sometimes escaped sickleless finches, which are actually tanagers from South America, uh, like the saffron finch and all these different things. This is an orange-cheeked waxbill, uh, vaguely like an escaped zebra finch in color with that orange cheek patch, but they're quite different in, in plumage otherwise. This is one to really keep track of because we know there's small populations, at least in Orange County, sometimes in LA County. And this is a known host of pintail whitas in sub-Saharan Africa. So it's probably the most likely, if they were more numerous, this is probably the host that pintail whitas would use here. But right now this and the other Estrilda waxbills are really kind of spotty and scarce here. So the uh, whitas have, have made a really pretty amazing switch to an, an Asian Indian species that they would not have encountered in Africa as the host. But we're really trying to keep track on these, of these wax bills. And then of course you get escaped Eurasian, European goldfinches, um, some of which are much grayer and look like Eastern Paleartic versions or subspecies. And these have bred in Southern California. So another thing to keep your eyes open for. Uh, I don't wanna spend much time on pigeons as we get toward the end here, but the varieties of pigeons are, are just mind bogglingly um, numerous. And um, these are just some of my favorites here from the field guide to pigeons. Um, a nice white one on the right that I suppose if you saw that you might think a ptarmigan, um, but just consider that a white pigeon is probably a little more likely here. Uh, famously studied by Charles Darwin. That's actually a Charles Darwin written label on this pigeon specimen from the, the British Museum of Natural History in London, uh, in the UK. Um, that helped inform him on variation in, in species. But you're all familiar with rock pigeons and you, almost any morph of a rock pigeon or any domestic variety is gonna not confuse you with native species. The Eurasian collar dove, which is now so common and widespread here, uh, does throw a wrench in, in things sometimes. Very distinctive, but uh, one thing you will find is if you get a reasonably large number of Eurasian collar doves, you're almost always gonna see a few abnormally pale individuals, like the one on the left. Um, it's not that rare, and sometimes they're almost pure white. And where these birds are common, you're, you're very likely to see these pale variants. And it's quite common for these to be misidentified as African collar doves or, or feral domestic African collar doves or sometimes called ring turtle doves, um, uh, which is shown here on the right, which is a much different kind of pinky buffy shade of gray. It's a smaller bird, very different vocalizations. And the black on the tail is limited primarily to the inner webs, doesn't extend to the outer webs. As you see over here on the far right, lower right, the Eurasian collar dove has got black on the outer web too. Now, I think, I, I, I have yet to prove this. I don't have specimens and I haven't seen enough, but I think that a lot of these pale variant Eurasian collar doves don't have as much black on the tail either. So it might further lead you to identify them as African collar doves or ring turtle doves. So just something to be aware of. And voice is probably the best distinction. Um, with our Parrots and parakeets, again, we know hybridization is occurring, but I just wanted to, again, reiterate two closely related species, yellow chevron parakeet, which is very common, and white wing parakeet, which is found locally, especially in Huntington Park, a few other areas. So the white wing, if it looks like that bird on the left uh, with lots of white, extensive white in the wing, and of course, in flight, that's very obvious, um, that's not a problem. But the bird on the right has that somewhat more hidden. But notice the the, the gray, pretty much bare laurel skin on the white wing parakeet. Whereas if you look at the yellow chevrons, they are pure, pure bright green all through the lower. So that's another good distinction. And finally, I wanted to just mention a just kind of a bizarre case here where we don't have magpies in LA County. Now we know if you go back 120, 130 or more years, Yellow-billed magpie has got to the Thousand Oaks Agora area right on the county line, uh, but they've retracted their range quite a bit. And black-billed magpies um, occur in drier gray basin areas north of us and occasionally will wander a bit farther south, 
but their southern range is retracted quite a bit. So when you see a black-billed magpie in LA, um, that's pretty noteworthy and, and quite likely an escapee. Uh, Mark took the picture on the left somewhere, I don't know what he said, Wyoming or somewhere where you'd expect to see a lot of black-billed magpies. But the one on the right was photographed at Point Furman. Um, I don't, it sounded very funny. Other people have documented this bird. It didn't sound anything like a black bill magpie, but it has not been recorded. We know that of a nesting pair of black bill magpies in LA Harbor uh, several years earlier, uh, probably now around 10 to 15 years ago, at least one parent showed mitochondrial, the female parent showed mitochondrial DNA of a Eurasian magpie. So that again raises that specter of ship assistance. Very common bird in Hong Kong and Eastern Asia. Could it have ridden the ship? Is that why it shows up in places like LA Harbor and San Pedro? And so what are these black-billed magpies? And it's a especially important question now that many have um, actually split the Eurasian magpies into two species, which in which case our more likely ship hitchhiker would be the oriental magpie, uh, which is common from like Korea and Japan down through China and the of uh, the Asian main, Eastern Asian mainland. And so we don't know what these are. I don't know if the split is widely adopted, um, but could they be ship assisted birds? So this is just something to keep in mind and their um, identification criteria of people haven't really thought about how you tell old, old world magpies from black bill magpies. Although it, potentially of course in Western Alaska, that's a big, a uh, big issue, although the Kamchatkensis, the magpie that gets into the stream Russian far northeast is not, that's a Eurasian and not an Oriental magpie. So it's a big mess, but if you see a magpie, please try to document it with photos and if, all, if possible voice recordings, uh, because we're still trying to figure out what these things are. And then just finally, I wanted to reiterate that anything can happen. We're in LA, anything can show up. All four of these birds, and I'm, I've gleaned these from various places over the years, and I'm really sorry I didn't attribute the photographs. I can't even dig up that information now, but these were all photographed in LA County. I know that black siskin on the upper left was in Sepulveda Basin. I think I got that from Scott Logan. Um, this Curacao was in the Western San Fernando Valley. Uh, Taracos, like the lower right, have shown up in various areas. We actually had a window kill Taraco from Beverly Hills come into the museum a couple of years ago. Uh, there's a hornbill on the left. And these are just some of the more spectacular things, but of course, all sorts of passerines and other things as well. So uh, it makes it kind of fun, but just be aware almost anything can show up. So um, if you see something really odd, you might have to go beyond your standard field guides and Get, get a great book like, you know, the, the Guide to the Pet Birds of the World or something to figure things out. So I'm happy to, if, if we've got time to try and answer any questions you might have. And I thank, uh, again, the lab folks for putting these on and Mark for providing me with a bunch of images. And I thank all of you for suffering through this. So thank you very much. And well, I'll uh, stop sharing and maybe we can have have some Q&A. We have a lot of Q&A, Kimball. There we go. And let me just, okay. Uh, first of all, from John Dunn, he has a Junko question. He, he asks if you're going to be doing Junkos on October 12th. <laughs> uh, uh, I think that was probably meant for the the host here because that's oh, one okay. of the things we're talking about doing as an ID thing in the future. I don't know if the date's been set, but yes, I told John I'd be happy to join him, and he will do the bulk of it. Um, <laughs> I hope um, at some point in, in the future. This fall, we'll do something on Jokos. Great. Uh, next question from Ken Ely. Uh, didn't cat, he has a cattle egret question. Didn't cattle egrets first arrive from in South America in the 30s? Do you know about that? Yeah, they, they basically made their way across the Atlantic Ocean. They're very good dispersers. And 
I don't know if it's the 30s or 40s, sometime around then, and then worked their way north and became quite abundant in California, really starting in the 70s and up through the 80s. And they've actually slacked off a fair bit now, but they're, um, yeah, that was a bird that colonized uh, presumably just naturally, you know, favorable winds carrying birds across the Atlantic. We know there've been some cross Atlantic mm -hmm. colonizations. Um, <clears throat> there's some really interesting birds in South America whose closest relatives are on the other side of the world. The, um, you know, the, the Donacobius or the black cap yeah. walking thrush, whatever they call it is a good example. That's basically related to, you know, some of the Sylviids and things from the old world, mm -hmm. but not that they flew across the Atlantic necessarily, but Catalegrits did and then worked their way north to North America. Sounds great. I also noticed in the q and I just wanted, you mentioned John's question about the Junko thing and then John mm -hmm. being my harshest, harshest <laughs> critic uh, also said, you didn't say anything about the primary projection on the bobolink as distinct from the bishops. And that's true, I didn't when I showed the the poll question, but I think I did mention that when I got to the bubble link later on. So thank you. <laughs> Naresh Satyan asks, is there a domestic duck spa option in eBird or on eBird? Never quite sure, he says, never quite sure how to deal with the Mallards um, times Muscovy <laughs> types. Yeah, well, they, the domestic duck option is actually domestic Mallard option. But Mallard cross Muscovy is also an option as well. So, uh, and they're usually pretty distinctive. I mean, if you see a Mallard like bird with a long tail and a bit of shiny black here and there, um, I would just go ahead and choose that Mallard Muscovy hybrid option, um, mm -hmm. even though it wouldn't necessarily be an uh, F1 hybrid. But uh, I don't know. I, we may not have that. Uh, above zero in the filter, so you might have to go into rare species or add species, but it's, oh. it's certainly an option. Okay, yeah, that's a good point. Good point. Um, from the live stream, uh, given all the non natives becoming established, what field guide do you recommend? <laughs> Is um, there? Well, the, the the handbook of the birds of the world is great. It's 17 volumes and it's very heavy, and you wouldn't <laughs> want to carry it around with you, but it'll have everything in it. Um, and of course, nowadays you can get every bird in the world on your on some, you know, app on your on your phone. But I would com certainly commend um, both the National Geographic Guide and the Sibley Guide, at least, and maybe some of the others, for being pretty inclusive about non-native species and treating mm -hmm. them and treating ID issues. So uh, your good standard North American field guides will treat most of these things, and um, uh if it's just the odd escapee yeah it's hard because you got to figure out what part of the world it could have escaped from to know which field guide to look at so there are actually there's some um, there's a simon and schuster guide to pet birds that i use quite a bit because it's mm. got many of the common avicultural species in it but otherwise um send me a picture i'll try and tell you what it is <laughs> Uh, we had a question come in also, are black-throated magpie jays in this area of, South, of Southern California likely to be escapees? Uh, the poster saw one um, posted in Riverside County on the rare bird, uh, rare bird alert recently. Yeah, well, they're either escapees or they're the descendants of escapees and mm -hmm. they didn't fly here from mexico and they get as close as southern sonora uh, but they didn't get here on their own they're they're pretty spectacular so popular although generally illegally as um cage birds and we know there's a breeding population south of san diego in the tijuana river valley area and the occasional pair here and there even as up into the los angeles area so um, that's a spectacular bird that people notice but Yes, there there's a small breeding population, so they've either escaped, such as the one in Riverside County locally, or it's the descendant of breeding pairs that that were established from escapees. Great. One of our uh, student birders, uh, Lily, asks, "How did uh, some of the domestic swans and gray-like geese become so white?" 
<laughs> well, presumably they were bred to look that way because again, there's been, these things have been under domestication for thousands of years and um, different varieties. There may be some reason they wanted to breed white ones. Um, you know, the, the proximate answer is they, you know, they bred out the pigments uh, that, that form the gray and brown and darker colors. Um, so it's just a bunch of, you know, genetic muddling basically and breeding. Um, and you see that in all sorts of in rock pigeons, in chickens, in mallards, in various geese. It's just very common to have varieties and uh, domestic varieties that are pure white. Maybe it makes them easier to see at night. I don't know. Yeah, well, yeah, I don't know. Um, Lance Benner asks, um, he may have missed it, but is it likely the Eurasian tree sparrow was ship assisted? And do you know how their population uh, yeah, in St. Louis? I think, um, yeah, I mentioned that because of their occurrence in the LA Harbor that it, it seems very likely that it was ship assisted, hard to prove. And it, you know, whatever that means to you, if it was in terms of quote unquote countability, but um, Eurasian tree sparrows and along with um, the Oriental magpies are probably among the most common birds in places like Hong Kong, uh, where a lot of these ships are coming in from or Korea or wherever it ha happened to be. And there's a lot of birds that ride ships all over the world. Um, yeah. They might be induced to stay on the ship. They might just land on the ship when they're at sea whatever. Uh, I don't know. I know they're certainly still in the uh, East St. Louis area, and I, I don't know how their population is doing. I don't think it's exactly booming, but they've spread a little bit, and they're still there. But our cool. bird probably didn't. I don't think our bird came from there. I think it's a thousand times more likely it came across on a ship or was a local release. Great, great. Uh, Lord Singh asks, are there any waterfowl species that hybridize so much that it threatens their population viability? Yeah, well, Laura, that's that's a great question. Um, I'm trying to think of examples. Certainly one I can think of right offhand is the white-headed duck in, in Europe, which is a relative of the ruddy duck. And ruddy ducks were introduced into Europe and have spread, and they interbreed with white-headed ducks. And it seems to be kind of swamping out a lot of the white-headed duck genetic purity. I'm hmm. sure there are many other examples uh, around. Um, certainly mallards expanding their range as humans change the environment have hybridized with and seem to be swamping out the, the viability or at least the genetic purity of Mexican ducks in parts of their range um, probably and modeled in black ducks in eastern North America. So yes, that certainly happens. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think, you know, the Muscovies are going to wipe out our mallards or anything, but <laughs> a lot of interesting things go on with waterfowl because they're not terribly particular about um, mating preferences. Okay, thank you. Um, from live stream, we get a question. Does forced copulation in a lot of duck species contribute to the amount of hybridization? Uh, I don't know a lot about that, but yeah, I bet it does. Um, ducks are pretty, how do I put it, forceful copulators. Um, <laughs> uh, there's some pretty amazing anatomical adaptations in ducks, including these extremely long explosive penises and things like ruddy ducks and their relatives, which you don't think of birds as having. Um, and you see a lot of, uh, you know, essentially, I don't know how to sugarcoat it, but I'd probably call it rape going on in waterfowl. And um, that certainly is one reason why hybridization is very common in waterfowl. Um, many birds, the males are not that choosy, but the females are, but in many waterfowl, the males are um, pretty forceful about it. So again, it's, it's not a, I could get into tricky waters here, both trying to <laughs> figure out how to put things in. Also, I don't know that much about it, but it's, a, it's a, certainly a good question. And yes, that happens. Okay. And John pointed out a couple of things. I'll let you. Yeah, it was about magpies again. And, and the old world black bill magpie or old world Eurasian magpies um, do sound very different. And that's 
I heard sounds out of that point Furman bird I've never heard from a North American black bill magpie. And if, if you watch almost any of the British show, BBC type shows or anything else filmed in Europe, Met Old World Eurasia magpies is one of the commonest bird sounds you hear in the background. Um, <laughs> and they don't sound like our black bill magpies. But John also points out that they fly differently. Um, I don't know exactly what the difference is are but um if they if flying differently means they'll fly from hong kong to san pedro then yeah that's pretty different <laughs> but, um yeah i would certainly be aware if you see a black bill type magpie get photos plumage and shape differences are pretty subtle but get recordings and pay attention to how they fly and john also points out that eurasian tree sparrow is not recorded from alaska although interestingly old world house sparrows have been found in westernmost Alaska. Um, so again, then nobody is saying Eurasian tree sparrow in California is a natural vagrant from Eurasia, but ship assist is a bit different than just a bird in a cage here being released. I mean, it, it's um, however you want to treat it. Yeah. But that, right now, that's just guesswork. Sounds good. And I think that's all our questions. Kimball, we want to thank you for presenting tonight. We had a lot, a lot of information came out and it helped clear up a lot of issues that many of us had. So we really appreciate it. Mark, are you still there? Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm still here. That was <laughs> a fantastic talk, Kimball. Um, glad to hear all the answers. And <laughs> oh boy, I didn't think you, I didn't think you'd duck that one. <laughs> See, we're not the only ones that have corny jokes. <laughs> Anyways, uh, thank you again, Kimball. We really appreciate it. And for all of you out there, please, please help support uh, Los Angeles Birders. We uh, really appreciate the support. It helps pay the bills when the bills come due and uh help and will help us continue with these great webinars and i think we all enjoy the webinars and in case you uh weren't aware all our webinars just about all our webinars are recorded and put on our website for you to enjoy at a later date or to go back and restudy as we quite often do and with that um mark is there anything else that i'm missing I think that's it. Thank you so much, Kimball. And we'll see everybody, right, thanks, everybody. next time. And okay. Sounds good. good. See you guys. See you guys next time. Take care.